This theme song introduced audiences to Betty Boop in the 1930s. Um, Betty Boop is, of course, best remembered as a very curvaceous, very sexualized cartoon character who was in her prime in roughly 1932 to 1934. Um, most modern merchandise shows her as she looked during this period, in a very small dress and showing her gartered thigh. But the Betty Boop cartoons that are shown most often on television and that are released on DVD actually show her as she looked just after this period. Um, from 1935 onward, she wore much more modest dresses and her personality was toned down as well. Censorship has been blamed as the main reason for the decrease in Betty Boop's career. However, there were many other factors at play. I'd like to prove that there were these other factors, including the rise of swing-era culture and Betty Boop's lack of character development throughout her series. Scholars need to focus on the relationship between censorship and the other two factors that I listed to decipher how such a popular cartoon character could become old-fashioned within only three years. Betty Boop was created by Max and Dave Fleischer, two Jewish brothers who grew up in New York, and the men were also responsible for creating the Popeye and the Superman cartoons. Betty Boop was their only original character. Popeye and Superman were both drawn from the comic strips. Betty was initially drawn by animator Grim Natwick, who is most famous for having worked on Snow White and he drew her as a caricature of famous performer Helen Kane, but as a French poodle. The Fleischer brothers came from a vaudevillian past, and this is referenced in their cartoons. Betty Boop's cartoons are structured very similarly to a vaudeville show. They include character archetypes, performing skits, um, comedy, some musical numbers, in a series of humorous vignettes. Uh, in her article, um, in Kristen McGee's article, The Feminization of Mass Culture and the Novelty of All-Girl Bands, The Case of the Ingenues, analyzes the impact that an all-girl band called the Ingenues had on 1930 society. The Ingenues was a gimmicky novelty, van novelty band linked to vaudeville, and in that way it's very similar to the Betty Boop cartoons. Um, McGee describes the success of the Ingenues and other all-white, all-female jazz bands in the 1930s by stating, These all-girl bands gained currency in part because of the widely successful and highly sexualized spectacles of girl acts, previously featured in a variety of popular theatrical contexts. For a quarter, film patrons were also treated to a variety show of 12 to 15 acts that often included a jazz band, dancers, comedians, acrobats, blues and operetta singers, and a whole range of novelty acts from whistlers to saw players, jugglers, and mimics. Viewers can definitely see this vaudevillian influence in Betty Boop cartoons, such as Stopping the Show in 1932. Betty um, sings a song, and then impersonates the famous performers Fanny Bryce and Maurice Chevalia. Vaudeville was becoming very stale in the 1930s. Vaudeville did not only affect Betty Boop in her cartoons in which she appears on stage, it, also, it affected her entire persona. Um, Kristen McGee writes, Betty Boop's highly coded jazz age sexuality ably represents such a combination of innocuous film actions and the sexualized, the sexually charged innuendos implied by these novel, musical, filmic juxtapositions. 
Um, every wink, wiggle, or suggestive action that Betty Boop would perform on stage for a cartoon audience was also intended for the audience that was watching the cartoons. It was her, her cutesy, flirtatious aura was a staple of vaudeville entertainment, and it was something that would drive the censors mad years later. The first thing that most critics mention as the downfall of Betty Boop's, um, of Betty Boop's career is the enforcement of the Hayes Production Code in 1934. This code called for the censorship of movies, and it listed various do's, don'ts, and be carefuls. After the code's enforcement, uh, Betty Boop's dress gradually began to cover more of her body. Uh, her dress also stopped flying up, falling down, becoming transparent, etc. It is intriguing to note that movie magazines did not talk about Betty Boop as often following the code's creation. Um, when Betty Boop was in her prime, movie magazines would have quite a few articles on her, and just searching her name turns up, her, turns up quite a few results several times in just one single magazine. After 1935, the magazines would merely list her cartoons um, along with other cartoons that were showing in theaters at the time, but they would not have any articles on her. Was censorship the reason for her downfall? Well, although the way how magazines talk about her does seem to support that, there are definitely these other factors at play. The swing era is something that we must consider as a very important aspect in the downfall of Betty Boob's career. Um, just to consider this, a December 1935 issue of the motion picture Herald contains one of the last articles about Betty Boop during the 1930s. Um, for one thing, this, was, this magazine was released in December 1935, which is a little over a year after the enforcement of the Hayes Code. So magazines were still writing about her for a little while after the Code's enforcement. Uh, the article talks about a Betty Boop look-alike contest in Cuba. Although searching Betty Boop's name in that particular magazine to see the number of times that it would appear, most of the results for Betty were for Betty Grable. Uh, Betty Grable is considered to have been 20th Century Fox's um, most popular blonde leading lady in the 1940s, but obviously she had gained quite a lot of traction in the 1930s. According to an Esquire magazine article by George Fraser, the dazzling slash of Benny Goodman's clarinet was irresistible from the moment it cut through air in the Palomar, Los Ange in the Palomar in Los Angeles on the night of August 21st, 1935. The swing era, although many people consider it a 1940s phenomenon, began in the mid-1930s. So the swing era was taking effect during the same time that Betty Boop's career started to go downhill, the same year that magazines were not talking about her as often. Uh, the swing era was a time for when women became bobby sockers. Their style changed quite a bit, from having short hair to much longer hair, oftentimes pulled back, sometimes even wearing slacks, having socks, showing their legs, but not in the same way that the 1920s flappers had, but it also came with a certain, more natural look. Um, Betty Boop's appearance changed to match this look. She became somewhat Disney-esque. She still looked very much like the popular 1920s flapper, which was very old hat by this point. She could be altered, but not changed completely to match styles of the time. An Andrew Kirkhoon article entitled Popular Music and Jazz in the American Junior College Music Curriculum During the Swing Era, 1935-1934 to Yes, I know it is a long title. Um, it discusses that community college students began organizing dance bands in their colleges in, starting in 1935. At that, um, up until then, dance bands were not a very common thing. One Betty Boop cartoon dealt directly with this, and it is entitled Sally Swing. 
One of the important things to note with this is that not only was Sally Swing intended as a pilot for a hopeful series, but Sally herself greatly resembles Betty Grable, an actress who, as I previously mentioned, is constantly associated with 1940s and that swing culture. The Fleischers knew that this style was not compatible with Betty Boop. Ultimately, Sally never did get her own series because it didn't seem quite popular enough. It was obvious that the Fleischers, with their vaudevillian tradition, although they could try and create a swing song, ultimately it was just repeating the same lyric several times over, and although the music was fun, they really couldn't go very far with it. One thing that scholars seem to miss when they talk about the downfall of Betty Boop's career is the fact that ultimately her personality was inconsistent. Um, she was full of these vaudevillian gimmicks in her most famous cartoons, but after the censorship, a lot of these gimmicks faded, and when they did, what sort of personality was she left with? We know certain things about her. We know that she is a very plucky character, but that's pretty much all that we know, is this plucky, quirky personality, but there's not very much depth to it. Uh, her personality oftentimes twists to fulfill the narrative. In some of her later cartoons, she even appears as the antagonist in the story. When, um, unlike other Fleischer animated cartoons that showcased Popeye or Superman, they were based off of comic strips, characters that already had personalities. Betty did not have this, so her personality was never fully developed. In her later cartoons, the Fleischers began introducing supporting characters, but these characters had full personalities, and soon they began to use her Betty Boop, and they actually began to take up more screen time in the cartoons than she herself. But I'm actually going to backtrack for something just a little bit, because I think this is important to recognize. Um, scholar Deborah Cohen's article, The Way We Look Now, states that the 1930s ushered in the modern idea of dressing up. Uh, men's fitted suits and women's evening gowns cut on the bias became staples of 1930s fashion, and those clothing items are still very popular today. Betty Boop did not start wearing the floor-length evening gowns that were popular in the 1930s until after the enforcement of the Hayes Production Code. Her very small dress looked more like a 1920s flapper dress. Her extremely short hairstyle, although short hair was popular in the 1930s, it was still very much a 1920s innovation. In the article, Secretary, Homemaker, and White Woman, Industrial Censorship and Betty Boop's Shifting Design, by Heather Hendershot, Miss Hendershot writes, Betty was designed as a flapper just as the Roaring Twenties ended. In other words, her look or design was out of date virtually from the beginning. So it did not matter originally whether or not Betty Boop was current as long as she was sexy. Her ability to be up to date only mattered when her sexuality was not at the forefront. So censorship definitely did affect Betty Boop's career. However, I believe that we need to remember these other factors as well. Betty's career was built on gimmicks, and her sexuality was one of them. When her sexuality was taken away, she couldn't build her career, she could not continue her career on many of the gimmicks that she portrayed earlier, because so many of them were linked to her sexuality, and her similarity to Helen Kane. When these gimmicks ended, her personality and her ability to be up-to-date came more to the forefront, and the lack of personality and the lack of being able to be current shone out like a sore thumb, and they were not strong enough to keep her career afloat. Ultimately, it was these three factors that brought Betty Boop's career to a sudden end.